Our theme this, today is Waste to Energy, Low Carbon Future. And uh, which one of you wants to go first? Who would like to go first? Ah, there we go. Paul Richard is going to go first. Paul is the Chair of Environmental Protection and Technology at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. He teaches, among other courses, solid waste management and has recently undertaken a fact-finding tour in Sweden to investigate methane production from municipal and agricultural wastes. His research includes worm composting, which is being conducted in partnership with the university in Cuba. Wonderful. So, Paul, you go ahead, and then I'll have a chance to introduce now after. All right. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I have the privilege of teaching a course that we call Garbage. Uh, it's quite fun. And one thing that I'd like to make clear, because my research interests were alluded to, I'm not a professional researcher. Kwantlen is a teaching university. We used to be Kwantlen College, if you know it that way. So my job primarily, and my presentation, will be that of an instructor that is not an expert, but someone for whom the onus is make sure that I know my stuff and I'm up to date on developments, including on what's happening in our great world of uh, garbage. So. I'm not someone you can call an expert, as in an expert witness, someone who does specific research in the field. I do play with worms in the compost with students, so I'll have to say that. Okay, so um, I need to proceed. So I guess I'll need two hands, one for the clicker and one for the, or can I just go here? Yeah. Does that work? Yeah. That does work, okay. Um, so, Right now, okay, you're seeing the, uh, the presentation. We've gone over that. Uh, there's my email there. Should anybody be interested in contacting me later for, you can't possibly have said that during the talk that I misunderstand kind of thing. I'll welcome any, any questions. Um, so let's go. Basically, looking at our situation with garbage, um, with waste. So what do we do really with our waste? The first thing we can do, and probably the easiest, is simply, well, let's get rid of it, let's ship it away. Um, from a moral standpoint, you know, that's why I put the boo in there, it seems, well, there seems to be something wrong about that. But since we're talking about climate, it's even worse in the sense that there's no away. Even if you ship something out of jurisdiction, whatever happens to it happens there as well. If it's too low, the atmosphere, with greenhouse gases, it will happen anywhere. So in the context of this talk, this is off the table. We can also landfill it. We can do it well or poorly. Older landfills are very questionable. New engineered landfills don't do too bad a job. We can incinerate it. And in this talk, I'll use incinerating uh, very loosely. I'll define that a bit later. But basically turning the waste into something that can burn in one form or another. We can compost it, at least some of it, or of course, ideally, um, and the first priority is we try to have as little waste as possible. We try to reduce the waste, we try to recycle the waste, and so on. <clears throat> so just going, talking about the WTEs, uh, waste to energy system, it's the more technical term because there are other systems than just mass burning, incineration, but I'll use the term incineration in general. There are two basic um, arguments that I've heard that I read against the idea of an incinerator. Uh, and the first one, and not one to be taken lightly, is that these things are very capital intensive. So you sink a bunch of money, you better run it so as to recoup your investment. And that means you better not run out of garbage. So what does that do to all our efforts of recycling, reducing waste, and so on? And I think it's an excellent question that is worth entertaining. However, in the context of what is happening here in Metro, that is already coming into play. We're not looking at sizing, or at least they're not. That's the other thing. I'm going to be speaking on for what some of you may feel is the devil's side. I'm going to be speaking in favor of uh, these, these designs. I'm certainly not speaking for Metro, though, and it might be things that Metro does that I'm not necessarily in favor of with respect to waste management. Um, but what Metro is planning to do, and I checked with them, what they told me is 
the incinerator, if it's an incinerator, the WTE is to be sized for a capacity that already includes an 80% reduction in the amount of waste, which is quite good and is certainly far better than we're currently doing. That should be and remains for everybody the top priority. We need to reduce, reduce, reduce. Now, should Metro be able to hit 80%? Another thing that they tell me is that, well, the composition of the waste overall shouldn't really change from what it is now. In other words, it's still something that can be incinerated or burned should we choose to do so. So that's the basic premise that the way they're looking at it, and they've convinced me that it seems to make sense, first is reducing the waste the realistic approach is, it's always you know, an asymptote. You can never be 100% efficient at doing that. And for the next, say, 30 years, 40 years, an objective of 80% is realistic. OK, so we run with that, which means that there is still waste that needs to be dealt with. Um, another thing that I've put up there is, because that comes into the conversation sometimes. There was a big splash in the papers a couple of years ago. Uh, Sweden. Sweden uses a lot of waste to energy technology and now they are importing waste from Norway. And everybody goes, you know, because we think it's wrong. <laughs> you, sh you should deal with your own waste and having to, having to bring waste from somewhere else seems to be totally, you know, a nonsense. Whereas in fact what is happening is they have a very good industry. It is not running out of garbage because of recycling efforts. As a matter of fact, the Swedes are doing extremely well, overall better than we are in terms of recycling. Nonetheless, they still have stuff, but they figure another way to pay for the investment is to bring in the waste from other jurisdictions that don't seem to have put that much of a priority into dealing with or reducing their own waste. So here you have it. That's an argument that is worth it, and the devil's always in the detail. But to me, I think, well, if we can do 80%, wonderful. We still have something to deal with. Uh, the second argument is, of course, we're burning the stuff. And we're burning from a large point source. Anytime you have an incinerator or anything else, you'll have a large chimney, a large smokestack. So that means you are putting pollutants in the air. And there's no way around that. Um, so just talking about conventional air pollution, not talking about greenhouse gases, um, what sort of pollutants are we dealing with? There are two that are often mentioned, uh, oxides of nitrogens, and those things are not good in general, but in particular because they're precursor to photochemical smog. Um, you know, when you see the sort of gray haze around or further up the valley you may see a brown haze that's very much related to that and globally the levels of ozone have increased so it's certainly not something you want to take lightly and not something you want to lightly contribute to however having said that one defense is that well in the overall scheme of things the total amount of NOx that a WTE producers, and those are numbers that I got from Metro Vancouver's website, by the way. Um, one can follow them. Looking at the current mass burn, looking at the Covanta system in Burnaby, um, it produces a, not even 1% of the total load of what is emitted in the valley. Um, vehicles and other forms of combustion, particularly if we go towards diesel vehicles, that's a much more important source. We also have large ships, and those are quite important. Um, we often hear about dioxin, because that's one of the big environmental bugaboos. Dioxin is extremely toxic. Dioxin is formed, even if you don't have dioxin in your waste to start with, dioxin is created under the right com uh, conditions in combustion. Um, but the thing is, you don't just, like when we talk about incinerator, you don't just have a large uncontrolled fire. You capture the smoke that is produced and you basically clean it out. And so it's just a matter of political decision how fancy 
a scrubber, a cleaner, do you need to get? The one in Covanta, which is not the up to, uh, you know, the absolute most modern one, the actual incinerator, it's now fairly old already, um, produces detectable levels of dioxin, but that's basically a detectable, and most of the time below the limit. So the overall amount remains very low. The same thing can be said for the toxic metals, uh, you know, the, the cadmium and stuff like that. Um, sulfur dioxides are important. That's probably, if there's any one specific pollutant that contributes to general air pollution concerns, it's um, sulfur stuff. And this is where the Covanta mass burn is not doing as good a job maybe as it does cleaning the rest. It's still doing a pretty good job. Um, the main pollutant, the main polluter when it comes to SOX actually is the ships that we have in the, in the harbor. And you know, in all comparison, it seems a bit rich to assign to the Covanta incinerator all the ills of our air pollution when in fact it's a very, very minor contributor. Um, likewise for small particulates, those are probably the most dangerous thing you can think of in terms of human health. Uh, the very small ones that penetrate the lungs. And again, those numbers are extremely low because again, um, Metro mandated Covanta to make sure that they do a good job and that is tested by Metro and then retested by Environment Canada and so on. So in terms of the air pollution, and you may hear different in a few minutes, but to me, this is not, if one is to decide whether we go to waste to energy or not, the air pollution is not, is a minor aspect in the whole decision. Um, okay, so incineration, I'll call this stuff incineration. There's several things in there. The standard incineration is just, let's burn the whole thing. Um, and of course, let, let's capture as much as possible, first the smoke, so that we don't pollute our neighbors. Incinerators in the 40s and 50s gave a really bad name when you think of a smokestack belching black smoke, that's what you used to have. And those, certainly no one would ever want those uh, under any reason. But we capture the pollutants, most of them, again, nothing's ever perfect, um, and we recover the heat. And the heat can be used to produce electricity uh, with high pressure steam, and can just be used as is for whatever you might need heat for. Well, get to that in a moment. You can also decide to heat the waste, but without burning it, without exposing it to oxygen. That makes the waste release gases. You can capture those gases, clean them up. We call those syngas for synthetic producer gas. And that becomes then a gaseous fuel that can be used in a form more or less similar to that of natural gas. Um, there's two ways to do that, straight heat or using fancy systems that use plasma arc and so on. What technology makes more sense? Uh, what is too complex and prone to problems? I'm certainly not an expert in there. I'm just saying they are there. They warrant being looked at, definitely. Um, then we have two other approaches. RDF for refuse waste, derived fuel. In other words, you take your waste somehow, dry it as much as possible, pelletize it so you now have a solid fuel that you can use. Um, and finally, for that part of the waste that rots, um, you can use it to produce methane. And the methane, of course, as biogas, is then something that you can use in a form similar to any other natural gas. So again, you produce a fuel. The net effect, though, is the same. Whether you produce a fuel and then burn it, or whether you burn the whole thing directly, you produce greenhouse gases, you produce carbon. And hopefully this is what you produce because the partially burned stuff is the last thing that you want in any system. The key in here is what are you actually burning? What is your garbage made out of? And I'm using the numbers very loosely. It depends locally, obviously. But roughly a third of the carbon in the waste comes from originally fossil fuels. Those will be your plastics that have been synthesized from acetylene or ethylene that comes originally from natural gas and so on. Two-thirds are biogenic, so that's anywhere from your food waste, 
your yard waste, but also things like paper and stuff like that, that come basically from plants that were growing not that long ago, directly or indirectly. In the carbon calculations, those are usually omitted, and again, I'm putting that in quotes, because you do need to spend some fuel to grow them a bit. So the calculation is a bit complex. But overall, if you want a, a caricature of the whole picture, two-thirds of the stuff that you burn is considered carbon neutral. It came from recent photosynthesis. So the question is then, well, what about the other third? Should we burn it? If we landfill it, it fits plastic. We know plastic doesn't biodegrade. It stays in the ground. It does not contribute any kind of climate change gas. I've got one minute. <laughs> in an ideal world, um, anything that we manufacture, we recycle. That is cool. We're not there yet. Be nice to be there. And everything else, we can compost. That would be great. Um, the composting bit is also a nice idea, but the idea that if you compost, you avoid any greenhouse gas emission, not true either. You usually compost something as biogenic, but composting means really reducing, stabilizing your carbon. So you produce a lot of CO2 nonetheless. You sequester some. Uh, we have a problem in Lower Fraser Valley when it comes to compost. I like the idea of compost, but we have too many nutrients to start with. Our farmland cannot absorb all the nitrogen and phosphorus that we produce. And also that's another thing complicating the issue. So compared to landfill, landfill everything is buried and goes away except that it produces methane. Now, a good landfill will capture say 80% of the methane. That leaves 20% that still is released as a greenhouse gas. Now, depending on the, the time that you use to make your calculation, methane is 30 to 50%, 50 times rather, more effective at warming the atmosphere than carbon. So even if you were to capture 90% of the methane, a landfill overall is way worse in terms of its climate impact. And all you need is one uncontrolled fire. And I can't speak anymore. Oh my God. Here are the rest of the slides. Can the, the, I'll just leave you with that. If we produce heat with an incinerator, and that's used in district heating, that replaces natural gas. If we produce heat in, say, a cement factory, that replaces coal. So that is a net positive effect in terms of climate. Um, hopefully, I can expand on that <laughs> during the questions. <laughs> Thank you. I told you I was brutal. Oh, <laughs> I'm so tight with time so that there is actually, we get in, into the debate and dialogue. So that, that, that will be fun. How do we move to uh, those slots? Keep going. Do you want to just, do you want to just help? That would be great. We're all right. Okay. So while that is happening, I get to introduce Dr. Dastein, uh, who's a professor at Debar Department of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences at UBC. Dow has served as Associate Dean, Research and Faculty Development in the Faculty of Graduate Studies and principal of the College of Interdisciplinary Studies. His professional teaching and research activities are in the field of air pollution, meteorology, boundary layer, layer meteorology, mesoscale meteorology, environmental science, and interdisciplinary science. Over to you, Doc. Thank you so much, and thank you all for coming here. And Paul, thank you for the nice introduction. And I really want them all to Are we live? Yes, you I are. really want you all to concentrate on the heading of Paul's last slide that he didn't have a chance to talk about, and that is the moral uh, dimensions of this question. So, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, acronyms, uh, abbreviations, um, uh, that are all important and unquestionably need your consideration and need the consideration of everyone on this planet. But I'm arguing that we have lost sight of another big issue. It's not an elephant in the room. This is a dinosaur. This is a diplodocus sitting all over us. So let me give you just three simple little reasons why we should be thinking much more carefully about air pollution than we have become habitual to do. Firstly, the World Health Organization report of April this year, outdoor air pollution was responsible for the deaths of 3.7 million people under the age of 60 in 2012. We cannot ignore that fact. 
James Hansen, famous, in some circles, infamous campaigner for reducing greenhouse gases because of the moral questions around the next generation and those following. He called air pollution the world's greatest climb against humanity and nature in an essay he wrote in March of this year. And now from a corner that you don't usually expect to hear stories about air pollution, Luce Irigay, sorry, Irigaray and Michael Mard are two French philosophers. We should regard it in brackets air because it's part of the rest of the sentence. We should regard air pollution as a crime against humanity. There are other citations if you want to go and look at them. I'm not misquoting. These are what these people have said. And they are giving us a warning. We have, since we crawled into a cave and lit a fire to warm ourselves, been ignoring the fact that we cannot treat the air like a sewer. And that's what we're doing. We're throwing it into the air and ignoring it as if it's gone down a pipe and it's no longer important. It's not a part of our lives. It's gone. And we cannot continue to do that. And because we're ignoring that, we're ignoring a whole range of issues that we should be grasping directly because the air is with us every day, every moment. Remember, you can live about six days without eating. Sorry, you can live about six weeks without eating, without, without eating six days without drinking and six minutes without breathing. Just remember that one. So how do we rectify the the conflicting values of reducing waste and providing a reliable energy source. And does waste to energy mitigate or contribute to the climate change? I'm not saying these are not important issues. These are hugely important. And Paul has explained to you why they're important and he's given you a really interesting introduction to how you should think about those. But I'm arguing that there's a bigger issue that we should be talking about. We cannot ignore the fact that we persist in treating the air like a sewer. This is both generally true and specifically true in the lower Fraser Valley, as Paul pointed out. So I'm not going to deal with the general question until one slide a little bit later, but I want to deal with the lower Fraser Valley. Here we have a place where the topography and meteorology conspire to make this an airshed that is not conducive to the dilution of, of pollutants, especially in summer. It is a bad place to be emitting air pollutants because the stuff gets trapped and it gets transformed and it forms, as Paul pointed out, photochemical smog whose most active constituent is ozone a damaging gas, which is an air pollution, an irritant, and it's largely responsible for many of those 3.7 million deaths. Not entirely. Small particulates, as Paul pointed out, are important. So now I would like you to, th and this is a hard graph, so please stay with me as I explain to you what's going on here. Um, this is a graph through time based on measurements taken by Metro Vancouver in the lower Fraser Valley. It goes from, well, the last you know, two decades. And on the left vertical axis is the concentration of ozone as a pollutant. And I'm going to show you four graphs like this from four different stations in the region. And the lines, the red dashed lines and the black dashed lines and the little dots, are how the percentiles of that pollution has changed over the past two decades. So at the very bottom, you see the 10th percentile. That's the value that's so low, only 10% of the values are lower. Than those. And then you go all the way up to the 95th percentile, so that covers most of the pollution we find, the 95th percentile, and then the top one is the record that occurred in every year. And what you notice at Kitsilano is that the backgrounds have all been going up, the lower percentiles, which represent the background <coughs> pollution, the stuff that's actually not very severe, but it's going up. And the 50th percentile, which is about half of the time, is now somewhere around 30 parts per billion. The pre-industrial atmosphere was about 15 parts per billion. 50% of the time it's now at 30 parts per billion. And the record has gone down. <laughs> Wonderful. By the way, the red lines indicate that that is statistically incontrovertible. It can't come about because of fluctuations in data. The, the, the black lines, um, we, we can't say statistically that's what happened. Uh, that the, the trend upward is, is statistical or not. I um, mean, Port Moody, a little further east, we see a wonderful success story. The, all, everything from the 75th percentile and upward has gone down. That is as a direct result of an air pollution control management plan instigated and brought about in this valley by Metro Vancouver, Fraser Valley Regional District, and actually has affected the lives of every citizen here who's now careful about garbage, driving a smaller car, 
commuting more by transit rather than, than vehicle. So I want to move further eastward in the valley because in these, both of these cases, you see the lower percentiles are going up and the upper are going down. But further up the valley, things get a little more ominous because in fact, the lower percentiles at Chilliwack and Hope, hello, <laughs> not ever, thank you. <laughs> um, yes, so, uh, so what we see here is, is all the lower percentiles are on their way up and the green line is the Canada-wide standard for ozone. Hope has been in serious trouble and is not out of it yet. Okay. So there we have a chunk of our valley which is okay but getting worse in terms of the background and a chunk of our valley which was not okay getting worse in terms of the background and they're not out of the woods yet. So the interesting thing is that that background, why is the background going up? The, the records, the high values are going down because we've managed it. The background is going up for a really scary reason. You know, we talk about CO2 accumulation in the atmosphere. Well, in fact, Paul mentioned this. The background tropospheric ozone, that's the lower layer of this atmosphere we live in, has been going up over the last three decades, from 1975 on the, the, the jaggedy line is measurements in the black line uh, averaged over a range of measuring stations in the northern hemisphere that are measuring backgrounds. These are particularly on the west coast of North America and the west coast of Europe. Um, the purple and red lines are our best model estimates of what is happening to the background tropospheric ozone because of increasing emissions from industries in North America and Asia. And scariest of all is the little picture at the top, which, a tracer, which is a tracer of Asian pollution. The star is the Mauna Loa station at the top of the volcano in Hawaii, for which these measurements on the, on the jagged lines are specific. And that shows you the tracer of pollutants, uh, that's actually fine particulates, that is now across the Pacific Ocean from Asia and is now impinging on our shores on the West Coast. So I will argue that incineration amongst any combustion that emits into the atmosphere must be ac accepted as a dangerous thing with many hidden costs. And we have become of the habit of avoiding those hidden costs. We incinerate only as a last resort after extensive, extensive diversion. 80% is not acceptable. Okay? And if there are good strategic reasons to incinerate, we incinerate. And if you get to the point of having to incinerate, you must Remove all the energy you can from the incineration stream. Take the advantage of the fact that incineration is hot and makes, <laughs> makes gases or heat that can be used uh, to good end. But you do not use waste to energy as a justification for incineration. And you know, when we have diverted completely and when we've got rid of single-use food packaging, my garbage will have, you know, one or two broken wine glasses a month. And wine glasses don't burn. I'd like to stop there. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> that was great, thank you. And well below time, which means we have, I mean, there might even be a few extra minutes for you to get a few things in there, Paul. Okay, so let's open it up for dialogue and conversation. Um, what I'll do is, is I'll, as you raise your hands, I'll, I'll let you know where you are in the order. And, uh, and then we'll also check in on the Twitter. So again, on Twitter, it's uh, at Carbon Talks. So one, two, three. Okay, let's take those first three questions. What I'd like you to do is, if you can be quite pithy with your question, that would be great, just very direct, so that we will take, shall we take the first three questions, let's get them out. If you could take notes on the questions, and then let's try, and then we'll go back to you as panelists after we've heard the first three questions. So, I think you are first, sir. And I'll come up oh, here. I'll bring it. That's right. Uh, it was in, oh, no, no, someone over there. No, okay, I was not, I was not. I thought you had your hand. Okay, you get number one. Okay, now we're That's good. Uh, question for Doe. You said uh, incineration is a last resort and that the recycling level of 80% is too low. So, you're saying we should go ask them in total 99.9% .9 recycling rate? Only broken wine glasses we can't fix? <laughs> we do not know. Uh, shall I deal with the answer? Go ahead. That's because we've got an extra. We do not know how far we can go in terms of diversion. 
version. I mean, we've been, we've been incredibly lax about this whole business. You know, we'll just toss it and forget it. 80% uh, is wonderful. I'm convinced we can go way better than that. And who knows where we will end. I believe there is a city in Japan that has made an industry of waste reduction, diversion, and reuse. And the report I read said 100%. I somehow doubt that. <laughs> it's somewhere between 80 and 100. And that should be our target. Okay. Paul, did you want to come um, weigh in on that? Sure. And I do agree with what has just been said. My quibble is simply with the time horizon. I think there will be, we've been producing modern garbage, if you will, only for the last 100 years. If you give another time horizon of another 100 years, I think we will tackle that challenge and not produce garbage to speak of. But when we're looking at things like WT, we're looking more at time horizon of 20, 30 years, in which case 80% is, to me, realistic. Okay, mm -hmm. question here? Yeah, I, I agree, the, the yeah. trans... I'm going to actually allow someone else to ask a question. We'll come back to that. Uh, question for Professor Stein. So it's my understanding that you still believe incineration to be the right use for that final uh, plastic content that is left. Because I see if, if we make maximum use of all the organic content, I'm left with a plastics problem. And I can either burn it and get some energy from it and accept the, the air pollution, or I can potentially landfill it there's nothing to, to decompose in there, so I don't get any energy, nor do I get any, land, uh, any air pollution from that. Uh, do you have viewers to, with that final position, which is the better use? Thanks. So, so recognize I'm not an expert in, in materials, materials use or any of that. Um, so I want to step half a pace backwards and sort of duck your question and say, I, you know, I don't know where we will end up, but it strikes me as kind of silly to be putting uh, fossil fuels into a garbage stream. There, I'm convinced there are reuse options. I mean, you look at, look at the history of disposable plates, for instance, and you'll see how they were advertised as the savior of all of the world, you know, and we know that's not true. We've changed our habits completely, you know, now we have multiple reuse plastic plates and so on. Uh, certainly the initial idea of just turf it is, is clearly wrong. Um, we, we need to rethink a whole lot of what we're doing. And yes, ultimately, if we do end up with combustible residual stream, we must burn it and, and get all the ways to energy. But I, I really am arguing for thinking big and thinking different. And I will absolutely agree with Paul, the transition is not going to be easy. And indeed, um, I'm a little worried about the, the possibility that we will end up with an incineration stream as a transition and then it'll become a permanent. And that, that worries me too. Paul, did you want to go in on that? Are you okay? Um, just to, to give a, a picture, I remember seeing a large district energy um, place in Munich. There's, they do have incineration, but it's not enough for all the heating for all. And that's a place that's about as large as this building, the whole thing together. Now, in my mind, I'm neutral whether that district heating system currently uses natural gas. If it were to use a very clean, sorted plastic stream, we're at the same end. Um, so the plastics could be, if we manage to recycle absolutely everything, we're left with some plastics for whatever reason, um, because plastics, we could go another route and come up with the only plastics used in manufacturing are the ones that do break down, um, which then don't let themselves to recycling. But if we do keep plastics in our waste, plastic is embedded fuel, I'd rather see it displace uh, fossil fuel, be it coal or natural gas. Okay, next series of questions. One here. Okay. Could you comment on the efficacy of, uh, for biomass creating biochar which locks in that carbon and sequesters it into the ground for, um, well, centuries. Okay, um, biochar basically is you take, if I understand that correctly, it's a form of charcoal. It's just, it's done in a specific way so that you end up, in a way it's like pyrolysis in that you drive away the volatiles, you end up with a form of carbon that is quite um, stable. And biochar has now been investigated in agriculture. It seems to work very, very well, in particular in soils that are highly mineral and poor, low fertility, 
a low ability to retain um, cations so, and retain water for that matter, using biochar to amend those soils, and it could be mine tailings or anything like that, seems to do wonders. And the thing that is bizarre about biochar is you think, well, it's just, it's just carbon. It will be broken down by microbes, re, um, re-emitted as CO2, like a lot of soil organic matter is, and that doesn't seem to be the case. So in that case, if we do use a form of pyrolysis, uh, that produces biochar, and the biochar then is used, or even simply stored, if it is indeed stable, it is sequestering carbon, and that to me is a very good thing. The flip side is, we are talking not about making biochar from, say, uh, wood or something like that. We're talking about waste. So what is the issue then with toxics that are uh, found in the waste, and particularly with heavy metals? Uh, for biochar to work, that question would need to be answered, and I don't have an answer to that. Um, no, I think that Paul's given a fantastic answer. I just want to talk a little bit about heavy metals in our waste. You know, the, the, uh, this is one of the really dumbest things we do in our society. We go and dig a large hole in the ground and discover a chunk of ore where the metal is in very low concentration. We expend an enormous amount of energy concentrating the metal in order to make some product that we want. We then take the product, once we've finished using it, and we throw it into the garbage and dilute it again. That is so dumb. Once it's concentrated, it must remain concentrated. So that the battery must remain the property of the battery manufacturer. We don't, I don't want the battery. I want the energy that's inside it. The battery is merely the packaging. That battery should go straight back to the people who made the battery in the first place, and the metal should remain concentrated. Uh, this question is for Dow. Uh, what do you see the time scale for getting better than 80% diversion, and what would you do what would you recommend to do with that, yeah. you know, disposable fraction in the meantime? Sure. So, you know, I was going to start on there, and, and we were going to squeeze. Just... So, um, a, a, this, this transition is as tough as is going to be the transition to a low-carbon economy. And we are probably going to have to have interim measures, which none of us like. And, and if we take an analogy with, with the idea of using nuclear power to achieve a low-carbon economy, you know, most of us are horrified at that thought, and many of us are coming around to think maybe we will have to do that as a way of getting ourselves out of the current habit. So think, think of that as, you know, we're going to need a transition to get to a new mode. What is going to be the transition? It may well have to be waste to energy. If it is waste to energy, or sorry, if it is incineration in whatever of its forms that Paul so nicely s summarized, um, we've got to ensure that that does not become the habit. That, that's my, my only real concern. How, we, how do we achieve it? You know, I hate to say this, that the, much of our society is gonna have to change its attitudes to the waste. It's not so much a technological problem as it is a change of attitude. So I, I wanna point out to you a really interesting thing that's happened in the field of air pollution. We have three or four examples of massive success in curbing air pollution, and they all have the same three characteristics. And let's take lead in fuels, for example. You know, there was a recognition that lead as an anti-knock additive in a fuel is not a good thing, okay? We were accumulating lead in our neighborhoods, uh, people's blood levels of lead were going up, we started monitoring lead a as an air pollutant, um, and people realized, no, this is wrong. Firstly, the voters said, we want to change. The people generally uh, were, were really agitated about the matter. Legislators finally came to realize that they better follow the voters. They brought in enabling legislation. That's the second thing. So public concern, enabling legislation, and the third thing was new technology. Okay? And once you got those three together, we have you know, non-lead additives for, for gasoline. We, we, we are actually reducing the amount of monitoring of lead in the air we do now. Most places are just dropping down the number of lead monitors they use. Why? Because we've solved it with those three factors. You can look at the same thing with uh, CFCs. Same thing. That's a common model. as opposed to this alternatives for lower carbon energy, you may be, um, have tougher decisions to make in terms of what the yes, alternatives are available. And the decisions will be in the political realm. I don't, I don't think they're in the technological realm. Yeah. Pulse. 
Yeah, I'm going to. Yeah. Okay, just uh, to add a couple of things there, I do believe there is a role for the technological realm. For instance, if we're talking about burning garbage, mass burn, um, in terms of total greenhouse emissions, that to me may be part of the solution if we replace fossil fuels. Uh, we're basically, you know, trading one full set of emission to one third. Now, in terms of overall air pollution, the stuff that kills you, the particulates, the NOx and so on, there is where technology can come into play. It's a matter of political will. If we come up with a very good, and of course, therefore, expensive system that really reduces NOx even better than we currently do, then we have a system that to me is viable and serves to pace us through the transition. Eventually, the hope is we'll run out indeed of the fuel. At that point, these plants, which we're just considering now, will be elderly and hopefully will have been fixed along the process. Um, but I don't see WT as a sort of a distraction, rather I see it as a great bridge. Great. So we're gonna take two questions in a row, so you might wanna take your notes. First question. Hi, my name is Christine, and I'm living in Vancouver, and uh, Vancouver in the 1970s, it was very pure air, was very beautiful. Now with all the immigrations, the government pushed for the immigrations, more people, more pollutions. Of course, we have to do something. And also, so many cars, too many cars. And uh, they want to do the electricity car or, you know, uh, less pollutions. But people, they don't adopt that, unfortunately. So I think they create a new model uh, for the uh, less gasoline. And uh, the worst pollutions in uh, lower mainland is the uh, the transporter transporting of goods uh, every city here and is a black smoke coming up the pipe this is the worst things i think they not even changed the gasoline for the transporter that should be done number one that's very polluted it's a pollutant so what's uh, the solutions for that so and then a second question uh, just an observation as you spoke, it occurred to me that uh, in, in some respects we need to go back to where we were. Uh, two examples uh, came to mind as you spoke. Uh, when I first started driving uh, in, my, in my local district, I would go and take my used battery, car battery in, and he would remanufacture it and give me the battery back. And the other examples, automotive as well, in that same time period, uh, automotive oil for home consumption came in paper containers with metal tops and bottoms. Okay, so comments. I think the first was maybe a little bit more focused on transportation than waste to energy, but is there something around an issue there that you heard that was... <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Uh, so, Christine, firstly, uh, you know, there are many, many sources which contribute to air pollution in our region and worldwide. And we have to tackle all of those sources. Indeed, heavy diesel trucks are, are an important, a very important source. Um, we have tremendous reliance on transportation of goods by heavy diesel trucks. Could we use more rail? Quite possibly. Would rail be less emitting? I, I'd like to see someone do that calculation. I'm not entirely convinced. Um, one that does disturb me, and as Paul mentioned, is ships in harbor. Um, we are badly in need of a change, actually of legislation with regards to that. Um, in my opinion, piracy is alive and well all over the high seas because ships, captains, feel free to do whatever they want with regards to pollution, dumping of bunker oil, uh, uh, sorry, a, a, a bunk of uh, uh, water. Um, so one of the problems with ships in harbor is that they are two jurisdictions away from the agency that has responsibility for managing air pollution in the region. It's the Metro Vancouver and Fraser Valley Regional District that have responsibility here. Above them sits the provincial government, and then finally the federal government, and the boats are in federal waters. So it is extraordinarily difficult to, to deal with that, that question. Yeah, so 
Oh, uh, yeah. Well, now we're getting on to an interesting discussion. <laughs> which, which we will save for another Carbon Talk. And in fact, tonight, SFU Centre for Dialogue is working on the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline in the, issue, in the issue of tankers. So, I invite you to the So, so just to finish off with, with Christine, the, 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 the real message I'm trying to bring to you is that there are many sources, many categories of sources. All of them have different behaviour. And we have no choice but to tackle them all, including sources and, and you know, I, I, uh, I'm afraid we have to shine the spotlight on ourselves. Um, the health effects of a moderate smoking habit are about equivalent to breathing fairly heavily polluted air. While we have smokers in this society, we have no right at all to tell any industry to reduce its emissions. None at all. While there are people who burn wood in open fireplaces, inefficient as they are, and to heat their homes, we have no right to tell any industry to reduce their emissions. We've got to shine that spotlight on ourselves first. No, thank you. And, and hopefully have... once we do that, we will have the moral high ground and then can scream. <laughs> so we have, we have a question from uh, Twitter. So I'm going to pass it. Two questions. Yeah, do one. Okay. Okay. So the first one's for Dow um, from Tom Peterson. What is the most important single step we can take to lower ozone levels and hope? It, so that was coming from Victoria. Hello, from Tom hello, Peterson. Hello, Tom. <laughs> yeah, I know Tom well. Um, we have to reduce overall all emissions of ozone precursors in the lower Fraser Valley in order to improve things at Hope. This is an extraordinarily difficult problem. Um, I'll just plug in something quickly. When you have a vehicle, depending on the type of engine you have, you have more NOx or lower NOx, therefore more low, lower or higher ozone. If you use traditional diesel, this is the worst emitter. If you can replace traditional diesel with, say, burning natural gas, you do, um, it's not perfect, but you do go away towards alleviating the problem. I just want to plug something about waste. If you can run your large vehicles on natural gas, you're doing a bit better. Not perfect, but better. The city of Linköping in Sweden, takes all the waste that rots, produces methane, runs all its buses and taxis on the equivalent of natural gas. So there are ways of using technology to get better. It's a thorny problem, I'll grant you. Great, we've got another question here from Twitter. Okay, this one's from Gwendal Castellan. And the question is, uh, on the question of ozone for NOx, what is the greatest contribution on Lower Fraser Valley? I hate to say this is complicated. It, so just to, to help the audience understand this, the ozone is formed by a chemical reaction in the atmosphere between NOx and volatile organic compounds. So the question then is, which should I reduce? Well, it depends where you are in the valley, and it depends whether you want to reduce the peaks or the lower percentiles. It seems the cutoff is somewhere around the 90th percentile, and for the western part of the valley, we must reduce VOC. For the eastern part of the valley, we must reduce NOx. That is why my answer to Tom was, we're gonna to have to reduce everything. Paul, did you want to uh, no. add to that? No, you're okay. Question here. I just was, um, I'm interested in the European numbers that they are, have just as much you know, success in recycling as they do in these waste to energy um, um, plants. And my question is, what comes first? Is, is the success in, say, waste to energy because of um, you know, the recycling becoming less necessary or vice versa? I mean, do they have an effect on each other? Uh, yes, I'll say they have an effect on each other, but it seems to be a positive effect overall. That is, if you look at the northern European countries, this is where you see the highest levels of recycling. This is also, and it may be a coincidence, the places where you see waste to energy adopted the most often. Now, each country is different in that respect, but it's basically seemed to have to do with the political will of 
we must manage our ways. So if you want the more anal countries of the north who like to control everything, are the ones who've made the progress. The Mediterranean countries, well, not so good. And therefore what you see there is poor rates of recycling and high rates of landfilling. Um, but their boats are two sides of the same thing. How well do you manage your waste or not? That is not to say that a country that does a very good job at recycling, like Sweden, must necessarily, like Sweden, go for waste to energy. It seems to be correlated, but one is certainly not a cause of the other. Okay, a question here. As you know, Matt, <clears throat> Metro Vancouver has decided um, to proceed with waste to energy and uh, I guess uh, at a size of 370,000 tons per year. I'd uh, be interested where each of you stand, I think I know where you stand, Paul, I'd be interested where Dow stands on the decision to proceed uh, with that method for, for dealing with the garbage over the medium term. Yeah, over the medium term, um, if I were absolutely convinced that they were moving as aggressively as they could uh, to reduce, to divert, um, then I would say yes, they, there's probably a good argument for going waste to energy with the residual stream. Uh, but as I have argued in my talk, uh, the lower Fraser Valley is not the place to be emitting more pollutants. As, as a short term, don't, don't incinerate in the lower Fraser Valley. And yeah, landfills are not a good idea. We've seen that and we have massive methane emissions in, in, the, uh, in the middle of the valley. So where do we incinerate then? Maybe in the Fraser Uplands where there's no restricted uh, mixing of pollutants. So here's another question. Hi, can you comment on Metro Vancouver's lack of a consistent recycling policy? You have 21 municipalities, and each one accepts different things. Okay, I, I cannot uh, justify that or comment on it, except to say that Metro Vancouver is an amalgam of different municipalities, all with their different powers, and all very, very jealous of keeping that power. The analogy is like is uh, Canada as a whole. We don't do the same thing as Ontario does or Alberta or whatever for the very same reason, even though we can look at, for instance, if we had a national energy policy, that would solve a number of problems in one fell swoop. So likewise, uh, if we had the political will to say, well, Metro is in charge, end of story, I think we would see a far more rational uh, management of the whole system. But I will leave that to the political scientists as to how we get there, I have no idea. So we're in our last question. Hi, I just had a question about the Sweden. Though their recycling rates are high, they're importing a lot of garbage and they're exporting the toxic waste back to those original countries. If our recycling rates get high and we have to import garbage, what's that effect of the transport trucks gonna have on the air quality? Sorry, what effect does the transport? Yeah, the transportation of having the extra loads moved. Uh, it depends on the total amounts. It depends on how far we're talking about. I don't think anybody, and certainly I don't believe it's Metro's will to in the future import, say, solid waste from Hawaii or something like that. Um, if we were looking at the whole valley, including our friends south of the border in Whatcom County, I don't think we'd be looking at much larger general trucking or train emissions in terms of moving waste back and forth. As far as the, regi the residual, the, uh, excuse me, the residuals after incineration, we're talking about a fairly small fraction. So the net emissions due to transport of that, if these are to be shipped far away, and that's a big if, because that's not necessarily the case, that is a much smaller fraction of, say, the emissions of the mass burden itself. Um, Sweden does a very good job of recycling. Sweden has now just started to import in some of its facilities waste from neighboring Norway, not long distances. Now, of course, there is talk in Europe of importing waste from Italy because Italy is uh, having a problem in the waste. It was all over the paper. Naples drowning in garbage. and That situation is very complicated. I don't think that that will see the light of day, but if we start considering waste, like we do, say, 
our oranges and our apples and are going halfway across the globe uh, to get processed and back, I don't think that's a winning solution either. Um, however, if within a logical jurisdiction, if some waste crosses borders, um, it's already the case. Some of the waste we have is shipped to the states, um, coming from uh, some places in further in the valley, for instance. That has its own set of emissions and liabilities as you change jurisdictions. Right. Some great questions, and it's been a. I, we always end on time, so there's, I hope, a, an opportunity. I know someone says I, it's like I'm a German train, train rail master here. Uh, just so that you have a chance at the end, if you'd like to take some questions privately, um, that the two of you, I hope, will be able to stay for a few minutes. I want to say a big thank you to uh, two groups in particular who make this possible, and that's the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. And it was nice to hear Tom Pedersen's voice come on. Tom, if you're out there, thank you for listening from Victoria. And also from the North Growth Foundation. They're our primary donors to Carbon Talks and then to the staff of Carbon Talks and SFU. Our thanks to both of you. That was a fabulous, um, both technical but also uh, compelling moral um, arguments and philosophical discussions. So I want to thank you. And I want to thank each of you for coming out today. Um, Carbon Talks uh, will take a break over the summer. We won't be doing any sessions in July and August. But we will be back in September. And uh, we hope that you've had a chance to sign. What sign in. If you haven't, we'll put this over here and please sign up so that you, we can tell you what's coming up in September. So please join me in thanking Dow and Paul for a great presentation. <laughs>